He's probably one of the more colorful people you've ever, you've ever met. And I've had the good fortune of knowing him for a long time. I count him as a close friend. And we really kind of enjoy, um, you know, poking fun at each other, testing each other, uh, embracing each other's successes and maybe a couple of failures along the line, who knows. Yeah. But yeah. really just a wonderful guy who's been incredibly entrepreneurial, incredibly tenacious. And so we'll kind of have a fun interview format uh, today to kind of bring out uh, some of the things that he's done. And, and you know, just from a high level, um, over really probably getting back since about 1985, you know, Greg has started at least three companies, and we'll, we'll talk about each of those today, and had, has had at least three exits, uh, one to Nextlink, one to Avista, and then most recently this year to a, to a private equity fund. So really just an, an incredible serial entrepreneur here, here in our community. Community. Well, maybe we'll go ahead and get started now. And uh, like I said, we're, we're going to do... Uh, do kind of an interview format here. And we're really gonna start from the beginning because I, I think that kind of uh, helps, helps tell the story. So Greg, where were you born? Born in Kellogg, Idaho. People are like, oh, why? Okay. I didn't really have a choice, but that's where I was born, Kellogg, Idaho. It's quite interesting. And then how, how did you, you know, you, I, I, I recall you, 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 you moved around, but you ultimately finished up at, at, at Coeur d'Alene High School. What, what can you kind of tell us about the point in time when you were born in Kellogg up until the time you, you finished high school? So my, my grandfathers both worked for Bunker Hill and, and they were in mining. And so um, I was born in Kellogg. Um, I had a grandfather who was getting ill. He went back to, to Oklahoma. So right after I was born, we went back to Oklahoma where actually is where the family is from. So we're technically called the Okies. Um, if you've ever heard that term, if you haven't, that makes a lot of it's sense. Not a bad, it's not, yeah, thank you. Um, and so my dad was, you know, he, he went to high school there. My mother and father, my mother had me at, at 15 years old. You know, she was pregnant at 14, had me at 15. So I honestly feel really blessed. You know, there are obviously options out there. And, but the parents, you know, they survived that. That I had a brother later who who still who lives in the community of Spokane. Um, but we, we, my father was in construction. So he worked on Grand Coulee Dam. Um, he was a surveyor by trade, um, worked on the SeaTac airport before it was, the name was changed. So we lived predominantly around the Northwest after Oklahoma, but uh, in Tri-Cities, worked at Hanford, but uh, a lot of moving, a lot of moving as a child. So lots of different schools that you attended. You, you were the new, the, the new face in the fall. Did, did that, did that um, moving around and being the new kid on the block, did that kind of contribute to your, your entrepreneurial DNA? They have. I mean, you, if you think about it, um, you know, I was, I was always the new kid. I remember, I remember I went to four, excuse me, in the fourth grade, I went to three different schools. So you were, you know, you were constantly having to introduce yourself to new people and, and, um, I don't think it was something that I enjoyed as a child, but later I, I think that probably created part of my personality is sort of outgoing. And, um, and, and as a young kid, it was, I remember it was tough, but, but man, I, you know, some great experiences along the way. And, and did you kind of have a, an affinity for business or entrepreneurship when, when you were a, a young man? They told me I was pretty quiet, which is shocking to everyone, but when I, when I was a yeah, right, right, you know that. Time. So when I was a child, uh, I, I believe my grandfather or, or parents, I'm, I'm not sure who bought it, but they bought me this gas station. And this little toy gas station had like doors and cars and there were, you know, there were, the gas station had gas pumps and there were tires out front. And every night, like I, it just started at an early age, I would roll the doors up of like the local gas station owner down the corner and I would put all the tires away. And it was like a business. And, and I was, I took so much pride in this little toy that you probably, you know, folded out in a box. So at a very early age, I enjoyed being entrepreneurial and, uh, you know, that wasn't really cool back then, but it was fun. Have you ever aspired to own a gas station since then? I have actually. <laughs> I don't think I want to own one now, but um, I have. Um, I've actually thought about buying one just as a, um, uh, uh, as an office and sort of leave the pumps out there just for fun, but 
no. Perfect. Well, that, that would bring it full circle. That would, um, yeah. So, so you graduated from high school in Coeur d'Alene. You know, what kind of student were you? Oh. Were, you the, were you valedictorian? Were you the class clown? Um, did you run DECA? What was it in high school for you? It's funny. I really was not, I knew of DECA, and, but I was really not involved in DECA at all. And the truth is, I, at an early age, I was always thinking to myself, I'd like to own the property the school sits on, but I have no interest in being here right now. And, and you know, I barely, I was probably like a CC minus student. And I literally dropped out of, you know, I took classes at University of Idaho. I had a football scholarship and I took classes at Whitworth and I dropped out there. I just was not really a student and I have ADD. So my attention span is pretty short. Um, but, you know, I, maybe that's good for business, ADD. I don't know, but it's been very, you know, it's been helpful for me. But um, I was not a good student. So, I'm, you know, it's not like the universities or the high schools call me to speak to their students very often. Yep. I, I personally think that um, ADD is a, is a skill set and an attribute for entrepreneurs because it enables you to do multiple things. I mean, if someone took my ADD away, I would be, it, it would be very unfortunate. I remember when I was in high school, my mother took me to a doctor and they wanted to give me medication for it. And I can't remember what it was at the time. This is like, you know, late, late eighties. And, um, you know, she asked me what I thought. And I'm just like, I, I, why change the personality? I am who I am, you know, for good yeah. or for bad. And, uh, and even later on, they asked me, do you want something to sort of settle down? Because it's really difficult for me to go to sleep when I'm operating in a company because yeah. I can't quit thinking about all of the things that we need to do tomorrow or today yeah. or now. So, you know, what really works for that, you know what works really well for that, Greg? Try CBD gummies. They are really, really CBD good. CBD gummies? Okay. Yeah. All right. And they're legal too. This is not something that's illegal. Um, but moving right along, so you mentioned football. Um, I recall that you 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 played semi-pro, pro. Well, you played some football along the lines, right? I, I did. So so as a kid growing up, I was I, I always was a football fan. And um, you, you remember when I, I I'm so old that there were no Seahawks around when when I was in high school. So you either watch, I think, the 49ers, the Oakland Raiders, or the Denver Broncos, and, and, and my family happened to be Raider fans. Well, coincidentally, my, my grandmother worked at the, uh, at the North Idaho College, and every year, Fred Bolintnikoff and Ken Stabler and a bunch of these Raiders would come up for a football camp for the high school guys. So Fred, I would follow Fred Bolintnikoff around. I still have his phone number now. We talk like every 10 years, but I followed that guy around for two weeks every time he was up. I'm sure I annoyed the heck out of him. And my father wasn't really part, you know, he was busy working. And, and I, I come from a father who's an alcoholic. And that was one of the key drivers. But I, I became a pretty good, pretty good wide receiver. And, and I had some football scholarships. And, and, um, and so Fred, along the way, he, you know, we stayed connected. I, I had scholarships at University of Idaho, North Idaho College, some Montana schools. And then um, you know, again, wasn't a student, came back to, uh, came back to Spokane and ended up playing for a team called the Spokane Fury. And the Spokane Fury was a semi-pro team that played at Joe Alby. Um, our quarterback was, it was between him and Dave Craig who made the Seahawks. So we had some pretty good talent. And mm -hmm. out of that, I had some tryouts and, and played some games in preseason with the uh, Portland Breakers of the USFL and also with the Montreal Concords, now defunct, but in the uh, Canadian Football League and and so you know but one thing that athletics gave me is you know you know there was there's a lot of hard work that has to go into that you know you have to be very serious very dedicated and and focused and um and that was a great I mean that was a great opportunity I, I actually thought about being a coach but I'm 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 really glad I took the career path that I did Tom yep yeah. and didn't you once play against a team that Donald Trump owned uh, the Portland Bank, we played the New Jersey Generals. Um, and in that game was a guy named Marcus Dupree. He was a Heisman candidate. I can't remember if Heisman, he won it or not. So Marcus played for the Portland Breakers. Um, uh, who am I trying to think of? Herschel Walker and Doug Flutie played for the New Jersey Generals. And uh, I don't want to get into politics, but in my opinion, Donald killed the league. But just my opinion. They wanted to go head to head with the NFL, but it was a pretty good league at the time. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. good, good, good story. I forgot about that. 
But then it, it, it was, was, wasn't it the, uh, you played for the Spokane Fury, which was owned by the guy that owned Kohler Tower. And the great segue, yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and that's how, isn't that what kind of got you started in, in the telecom business? So I was very entrepreneurial and, and Gary, uh, Gary Barton, and uh, I, I think he had passed by, by now he's passed, but um, Gary owned Kohler Tower, Tele, uh, Tele, Kohler Tower United. Kohler Tower United was one of Spokane's 30 years ago. They were the largest plumbing, electrical, um, you know, dealer, distributor, I installer. Well, they also then created a telecom division. One of the things that you notice about telecom is divestiture over the last 30 years. And the first thing that you saw is that you could buy, strangely enough, you could buy your kids their own Mickey Mouse or Minnie Mouse phone for their room. This is when you had a landline. This, is, this isn't cell phone days. So, but by virtue of being able to buy your own phone and actually plug it into, you know, the, the Pacific Northwest Bell Network, um, that meant businesses could also own their own phone systems. So, I, I was working for Gary uh, for whatever reason, uh, Gary Cord Tower Telecom. For whatever reason, that company went out of business, went bankrupt, and I started the business of Tel West, T E L W E S T. Tel West is still around today. I had sold that to Danny Gibbs uh, probably 20 years ago. But Tel West today installs telephone systems, PBXs for offices, banks, uh, you know, universities, and things like that. So, so that was my first sort of jump into the telecom space was was because of you know the business I'd worked for, company I'd worked for went out of business. We then, I formed Tel West, worked out of my home, made maybe $25 an hour servicing people's telephone systems and grew the business to at some point, you know, we were in Seattle, uh, Tri-Cities and uh, Spokane. So we had a pretty, pretty nice operation there. Um, and and that, was, that was 1985, is that right? Or 1985-ish? Yeah, correct. That is correct. Yep. So that's roughly 35 years ago, you started your first telecommunications company. And then you, you sold, you sold Tel West or no, you, so you ran that for roughly 10 years. And then if I recall, you sold it. So what was interesting is, is we were, you know, we were, I, I, I've always been, I love, like I said, I've always loved business, but we had a business that every month you started over, meaning like you would sell a phone system to a company and we had 20 or 30 employees running around. But every month you had to sell more phone systems and you had to look for more service work. And I'd always been intrigued by what's called the reoccurring business model. Yeah. And that is, that is if you build someone for a certain product, software, service, or solution, um, or much like we just talked a little bit ago, you know, you've got um, people in, uh, on this call, the Wolf family from the real estate industry. And so reoccurring revenue like rent is something I've always wanted to do. So in, in the particular case of Tell West, we continue the division of selling and installing phone systems, but there was deregulation where we could now provide your phone service. So the dial tone, when you picked up the phone, the actual dial tone that you heard in your ear, that you could connect calls across the country, the world, world or the city, we created a division of Tel West that basically um, went through and built fiber and copper throughout the skywalks of downtown Spokane. Uh, we had to go get a city franchise permit to do that. But we went and built fiber and copper through the Skywalk, and we were able to essentially create our own phone company. So, you know, every month we would add more and more subscribers to this network. And as we're adding these subscribers, um, the regulation is continuing to happen. You know, first it was, you know, your phone, you could buy your own phone or phone system. Now you look at long distance. That was a big deal, you know, 20 years ago, long distance. And now you can have your own phone provider. And so, so that division ultimately was sold to a gentleman named Craig McCaw, the billionaire who created Cellular One. Okay, so that was a division that. of Telewest that you started. Yeah, so we sold that piece to Craig McCaw and Nextlink. We became, we were the third acquisition of Nextlink. And then I later sold Telewest, the telephone division, or the telecom PBX division to a, a young lady named Danny Gibbs, who still operates it today in Spokane. Okay, now, now, now let's just kind of rewind a little bit here. When, when you started that division, um, that, that's about when I got to know you, and you were kind of stringing copper and, and fiber throughout the skywalks in downtown Spokane, and, and did, you, did you ask for permission to do that, or did you just kind of start stringing this stuff and then ask for forgiveness later? 
approach me like that? What would make you think I do something like that? Um, okay, we started stringing some initial copper and fiber, <laughs> and then we asked for yeah forgiveness. Uh, no, we we uh, your brother who's been an attorney of mine well till he retired. Um, we had to go get a city franchise, much like what the, the cable company has to do if they want to provide cable television service in any given market. They need to go to the city and, and get a city franchise. So, so we began the process of connecting a couple of buildings, but ultimately we, we, we did understand that, hey, look, if we're going to do this on any large scale to protect our fiber and our copper, we're going to have to get a city franchise. And we got one. And, you know, it's an interesting story. Like, we also needed not a city franchise, but we needed to permit to be the first competitive telecom company in the state of, of uh, Washington or particular for us in Spokane. So it cost about a quarter of a million dollars to have an attorney take that process through the Utilities Commission 25 years ago. So what we decided to do, and I think this is a good lesson for people on the call is think about where you spend your money. So what we did is we wait, we said, Nobody's ever going to build a monument that says we were the first company to be a competitive telephone company in Spokane. So we waited for a company called Electric Lightwave to go first. They spent a quarter of a million dollars, and for less than $5,000, we slid in second, and uh, the rest is history. But it's just a smart way to go. Is it always that important to be first? Sometimes being second. And using your money correctly makes a lot of sense. So I just thought to share that, Tom. No, that's good. Being a fast follower. Being a fast follower. Um, so then, but so how how did you get on the on on the radar screen of Nextlink and Craig McCaw? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, we might, you know, it could have been because we are registered as a telecommunications carrier or a competitive telecommunications carrier that maybe they looked at the Washington Utilities and Transportation Commission. Um, but but lo and behold, um, you know, one of Craig's guys. Um, contacted us. Craig has guys. Um, he has people that deal with it. I have a funny story about that. The, the very same guy that approached us about selling this division to Craig McCaw and become part of NextLink is the very same guy um, that helped uh, purchase Free Willy, the um, fish. Not, I'm not kidding you. Um, his name is Mark Callahan and Craig McCaw's wife, after they had the movie Free Willy, right? Well, they didn't know what to do with the whale. So Craig McCaw and his wife bought the whale. Now the whale's parked. The whale is literally parked in Mexico and we need to get the whale out of Mexico. There's an entire story that I could tell you about. It's pretty funny. But the point is Craig McCaw's, one of his people, Mark Callahan, same guy who freed Willie, literally, um, is the guy that approached us. And we've become friends for a year. We, we still are friends, but they approached us and said, hey, we're gonna grow a nationwide telephone company. It's called Nextlink. I'm gonna fast forward really quick. Verizon owns all of those assets today. Um, it went from Nextlink to XO Communications. If you see the building downtown Spokane, that says XO on it. That's the big building where all the computers and the brain trusts and all the fiber from this region goes into that building. And uh, years ago, my partner, Jared Miller and I owned that. I think Jared still owns it. I sold my half to him. But uh, that's just a little story about Nextlink. And we, we so were how, but, at, the time, at the time that Nextlink bought you, were you just in Spokane and just in downtown Spokane? We really were. Yeah, you really have to have concentration to get scale and economics. So we were really in just downtown Spokane and focused on that. And, you know, I mean, I remember the days of losing call records. Like, we lose long distance records. And, you know, that's devastating. Like, thousands of dollars in calls we lost. And, Trials and tribulations. You don't just go to, if anybody remembers this name, um, Radio Shack, that's it. You don't just go to Radio Shack and say, I want to buy software to be a phone company. You know, it's, you, you don't do that. So you have to buy code or you have to hire someone to build code. And um, I mean, those days, and it was extremely stressful. I mean, it, it, we'll talk about Fat Beam here in a bit, but it is very capital intensive to operate a phone company, whether it's the fiber you're building or the switching, because you always need something new. Yeah. The IT guys always have a better, you know, widget that comes out. Okay. So, but, but, but really, it was shortly after you started this new division of TeleWest that NextLink bought you. Within a year or so? Something? I think it was about almost two years. It was about two years. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you were one of the early acquisitions of NextLink, and then they went public. 
was part of the team. I was the youngest. I was 36 at the time. And we, we, uh, we raised $400 million um, on Wall Street, which isn't a lot today. That's like a half a billion today. That's, you know, I mean, that's a lot of money. But at the time, it was a big amount of money. Today, in, you know, billionaire, billionaire terms, it's not so much. But we raised a half a billion dollars to grow. And essentially, we were going to be the local phone provider in every NFL city in the United States. And just because Craig happened to buy us, we were the only company, we were the only city that was a non-NFL city at the time. Now there are other cities, but we then built fiber in New York, Seattle, LA, you know, you name the cities. And we had a, a nationwide phone company because at that time you had like US West with, who was sort of out West. You had, you had maybe, um, uh, hang on a second, a Cincinnati Bell was in you know, the Midwest. And then you had uh, SY New York, telecom so you had regional baby bell companies there wasn't one nationwide um phone company and that's really what we were out to do so um i think we did a pretty good job with that i was there three years you know traveled a half million miles a year looking at new market development so not only was i the president of the west region uh, or northwest region i was also responsible for merger and acquisition to look at other deals like that being or excuse me like the tell west at the time to acquire. Okay. So, how, so to you, you were kind of a startup guy. How did yeah. you, how, how was the transition from kind of running your own regional business and doing things your own way to working for a publicly held company with the, the structure and rigor that is implied by that? I'll tell you, I, um, you know, I was, uh, I was, when I came, I, I would say I was very much a rookie. When I came in at 36 years old, when I came in to work at NextLink, I realized how much talent we had and, and the term process, protocol, project management. I mean, I've heard of those, but I'll tell you what, didn't really understand the importance of them and scaling and economics until I went to work there. It, it was, it was like an MBA lesson for me, Tom. Yeah. It was, it was one of the best things that I've ever been through. I wouldn't change it for anything, but we had some amazing talented people that worked at that company and you're right. I mean, there's, there's a lot, you operate much differently. You know, yeah. there, there's, there's a lot of covenants that go along with the responsibility of having a half billion dollars handed to you, you know, so. Yep. Okay, so from a timeline perspective, you started Telewest in, in 85, you sold it to NextLink in 95, they went public in 96, then you hung around till maybe 98 and retired. Took a year off, um, yeah, I think, you know, you probably know I got fat. I, got really fat. <laughs> I did. Yeah. I did. When I went to the doctor, I'm like, I'm getting fat. And he's like, you're not doing anything. Like, you, you know, you're not doing anything. I'm like, well, okay, thanks. But I was working out every day, but my metabolism just went sort of, you know, off a cliff. And uh, so I took the year off and I decided, huh, I'm 36. So I'm close to 37 now. Um, what happens to all the markets that aren't NFL cities like the Yakimas, the Bellinghams, the, uh, the Bend, Oregon's or, you know, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. So can't stop it. Cause I'm a startup guy. I started a company called 180 communications and we were going to build um, a competitive phone company in the smaller markets. Okay. So we've done Spokane that Seattle's been done. Now we're going to go to Bellingham. We're going to go to Yakima, those markets. So we started doing that, 180 Communications. I started hiring all the NextLink people that I thought were really talented until I got the letter from the attorney that says, stop doing this. Okay, it's kind of yeah. a joke because he's a friend of mine now, but um, or he was a friend. That's when you asked for forgiveness. Forgiveness, exactly. You need to do that and you ask for forgiveness. And then yeah. if they don't really listen to you, then, then you have to get your brother involved as an attorney. But anyway, um, so, so we hired some really good people. We built 180 up, but it was mo not more than, I think you know this, Tom, it wasn't more than six or eight months of Vista. Um, and for whatever reason, well, every- well, Slow down. So when you started yeah. 180, did you start yeah. it by yourself? Did you bring in investors? Um... I started by myself. I put a couple million. I think I had $2.8 million into the deal. And I started on my own, but again, very capital intensive. We yeah. were going to go out to additional markets like Billings, Montana. So we were sort of looking for a partner. And at the time, Avista had some fiber that it didn't really know what to do with. They built fiber for like economic development and for their substations. So um, 
they basically end up buying, Avista end up buying 51% of 180 in six or eight months of me starting it. I became the CEO of Avista Communications. And then we merged their fiber assets and then 180 together and created Avista Communications. And what, what, what's, what's the general time frame that, 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 this, that this occurred? Say we're right around now, we're right 98, 99 time frame, right in there. Yeah. That was a pretty crazy market environment for telecom, as I recall. Seattle, if I, if I remember, were you not in Seattle at the time or were you working on both places? Uh, I, I, was in, I lived in Spokane, but I had an office in Seattle and was over there a lot. Yeah, I knew there was a connection. Um, was, as I recall, I mean, that, that, was just a, that was just an incredible time frame. And it was within that general window that, you know, Telex filed to go public, like at a billion dollar valuation. Um, my, my guess is, uh, you know, your, your Avista Communications probably had some astronomical market value at one point in time. Yeah, it's funny you say that. I think we were worth within like a year and a half, we were worth a hundred. We had $15 million invested and we were worth $140 million. And we had, we were losing money. I mean, there was no EBITDA. You know, there, there wasn't earnings before interest taxes depreciation. There, there was just a little revenue. But yeah, those times were crazy. I remember a, a business in Seattle owned wireless spectrum and they were, they were worth a billion dollars and they had like $100,000 of revenue annually. Mm -hmm. It was just crazy time. Yeah, silly time, silly numbers. Yep, yep. Well, we're, we, we might be seeing a little, bit of that, a little bit of that today, particularly you look at the valuation of Snowflake that went public yesterday. There's some, there's some crazy times out there again. History does tend to repeat itself. Yeah. So you, so you, so you, uh, you sold to Avista, uh, rebranded Avista Communications. H how long did you, did, you, did you stay there? What was your role? The CEO of the company, and we had it for about three years. But if you remember, since, since we're talking about the 90, 98, 99 timeline, remember, everybody remembers 2008, but some people forget about 2002. 2002 is, it was pretty bad. It wasn't the full-on recession or depression, but it was a recession. And um, so in 2002, um, I was approached by uh, Gary Ely, just a great man. He's the CEO, was the CEO of, of Avista, Avista Corp, the utility. And he's like, Greg, we need to see, you know, we're still burning cash. I mean, it's expensive to lay fiber and whatnot. We're burning cash. So he just said, Greg, we, we probably need to sell this division. So he wanted me to start looking for, for um, partners, okay? By that time, it's it's too late. I mean, the market, you know, the utility market, they're struggling. I mean, they're, if I remember back in the days, there was some oil, or excuse me, um, utility trades were going on. California was having blackouts. And I vaguely remember the details of that. But, but I know that utilities generally were struggling, let alone companies in our industry where it was bad. So it was bad on both sides for them, being an owner of telecom and being in the utility business. So I went to go sell. We really couldn't find any buyers. Um, I owned, at that time, I think I owned 20 some percent of Avista Communications. So, so I just said, hey, like, if you want to write this off, which is probably what they needed to do, they needed to stop the bleeding. If you need to write this off, why don't I give you my 20 some shares of Avista Communications stock? I'll own X markets. And I believe I owned, I know I owned a Billings, Montana and some other assets in Spokane and Coeur d'Alene. And then I handed them my stock. That way, they had no other minority shareholders, and they could do with it what they wanted. So I think they parsed off um, a number of the assets, sold them to uh, different telecom companies that, that were in those markets that I mentioned earlier. I ended up taking billings, and, and I made it extreme. You know, it, it ended up being pretty profitable. And I think we sold that for like eight million dollars down the road. But we had to hang on to it for a while and let this ride the storm out. Um, so, so that, that's sort of what we end up doing is, you know, we hung on long enough. And of course, look what Avista's done. They're, they've done a great job. They're, they're just a great, people don't appreciate what it's like to have your utility headquarters in your backyard of Spokane. I mean, you can live in another city and, and they just have service vehicles that take care of you. All of those great wages at Avista are right here in our community. And I, I, I just can't say that enough. I've said it before, but that's pretty powerful. There's some good yeah. salaries out there and they stay right in our community and they're, they're pretty good about entrepreneurial 
you know. Oh, they're um, fantastic. I mean, uh, you know, Vista is uh, hugely supportive of Ignite, SAA, and uh, a great community asset. So I, I, uh, I completely agree with you. So, so are, are any of those uh, uh, operations still in existence? Are they still operating? Um, Billings or? The one in Billings, um, I, the irony, one in Billings is owned by um, a company called Zeo, which happens to have fiber in, in Spokane. They, they were you know, bought through a friend of a friend or friends. So, so okay. that's a Zeo company now. Uh, some of them in Spokane are Zeo assets as well. And I think in Yakima, let me think, uh, Yakima ended up being a Zeo asset. And I believe U.S. West bought some assets as well. So they were kind of all parceled off along the way. But what I think is kind of intriguing here, you know, remnants of these businesses that you started upwards of 35 years ago are still operating. You know, TeleWest, the Exo Communications Building, you know, some of these cities. Um, you know, it, it's, it's uh, I think it's compelling that these businesses are still out there in some form or fashion. Yeah. Fun, you know, you, you, you build these things and you hope that the community, you know, I mean, obviously you're an entrepreneur and you want to be financially successful, but at the end of the day, you hope that, that you could create some jobs from that and, yeah. and that would last for a while. So it, it does feel good when you can make that happen. So I mean, one sure. thing I've observed as a venture capitalist, as an angel investor is sometimes you have a great investment. The financial returns are really good, but the company just disappears at some point in time. Um, so many times, you know, doesn't it? In a perfect world, not only is, is it a great financial return, but, but the business lives on. It continues to grow or prosper. And, and yeah. um, you know, quite frankly, you don't really see those two things in parallel a lot. Um, you think just because you got a great financial return that, that the business has also prospered and continued, but right. not always the case. That's a really a good point, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so we've, we've kind of taken you through uh, two companies now, TeleWest and 180 Communications, and, and, uh, which became uh, Vista Communications. Once that was uh, kind of off your plate, so to speak, you, you ran into uh, Sean and started your third company, Fatbeam. Tell, tell us how, how that came about. It's funny. It's interesting. I had met this this young guy. He he had a ponytail, and, and he was a he was a total nerd. And I'd met him on on the boat. You know, the what's next boat. Um, uh, had a boat on Lake Coeur d'Alene. It was called What's Next, and it was named after Next Link. But anyway, I had met Sean. He was going to school at the University of Idaho, and you know, the internet is just happening and things like that. And Sean Swamby, who owns a company called Ednetix in Post Falls, Idaho, an extremely successful company. He should be so proud of what he's built. He's had it for 25 years now. He started building, he started doing IT support for University of Idaho when he went to school there. And he grew this IT support business into, you know, imagine a school district, K, K to, I mean, they do, they do uh, colleges as well, but imagine K-12 and under, anything on the property of, of a school. So let's just take an elementary school. You know, there was a day it wasn't as important, but there's some crazies out there now. So, so you have cameras in the parking lot, security cameras, they do that. You have all those cameras have to talk to wireless switches and routers. They do that within the building. Um, you know, the security systems in the building, they have a phone system in the building. They do all things related to educational uh, technology. So they're really good at it. And what I think that it, one thing, if I could just share this for a second is, Sometimes when you're in business, you have to do a little of everything when you get started because you got to bring the revenue in to support the costs. Okay. Sean, Sean stayed true to his model. He stayed within education and that has paid off so much for him. If you are in, you know, if you're a school district on the West coast and you need a phone system or security cameras, or you need um, switching or routing, you know, you'll know of Edmetics. And so, so Sean, you know, he, Yakima is a great example. They have, you know, a thousand cameras between all of the 25 schools. So he and I had been introduced 30 years ago, hadn't talked for 20, 30 years. We get reintroduced by a gentleman named uh, Mike Peterson, who was a Cisco rep in this community. And I know you know Mike, I'm Bill Kalibas, he runs with Bill. And, and so anyway, he's like, you know, you guys need to get together. Greg's going to build another company and Sean, Correct me if I'm wrong, but if you have a thousand cameras and they all need to be talking to each other, 
how are you getting enough bandwidth between all of the schools? Well, that translates into fiber optics. You need enough fiber optics to connect, you know, a thousand or 2000 cameras together. And so, so we reconnected and we're like, why don't we start a company? And, and so it was kind of a funny joke. The, the running joke was in Yakima, the cable company was providing a, a wide area network. So imagine 25 schools. There's 25 schools on a, on a map in Yakima. Those schools are leasing for $35,000 a month, a one gigabit circuit to connect them all. But that's not enough bandwidth to, to make sure that they have high definition cameras. So we essentially, remember, $35,000 a month is what they were being charged by the cable company. So we could go in with that one customer and build an entire fiber infrastructure network in the city of Yakima. And I think we ended up charging like $26,000, $27,000 a month. And then we own a fiber network that not only did we give them, instead of one gigabit, we gave them 40 gigabit of capacity between all the buildings. And, but we built an extra 200 strands of fiber so we could serve other businesses in the community. So, so Fatbeam, that's where, how Fatbeam was created, was we built fiber networks to connect schools together. Those, that tenant or that customer essentially funded a market for us. So new market development for us was a school district that needed a wide area network to meet their data needs. Okay, so just, just to put it in context, you and Sean, roughly in 2009, 2010, co-founded Fatbeam. And, and did you guys bring in, again, angel investors, venture investors, or was it your own capital? Well, so Sean and I had some of our own personal capital that we had put in. And then what, we, what we've done, this is kind of a model that should be important to some of the people who want to start a business is, you know, you, you can put your seed financing in, but if you can get bank capital at five and 6%, which we were getting, you know, um, then we just, we financed it internally. So that might mean every couple of years, we have to put a little bit more money in the match. It, it looked, it looked a lot like a construction loan. We had to put 20% in, they would finance the 80% against the school contract. Um, so that's how we financed it initially. But as you well know, that's going to change in what, what uh, somewhere on our map here around 2008, or, or excuse yep. me, what was it? I, I guess it wasn't eight, wouldn't be eight, wasn't 15, wasn't it? 17. Yeah. Sorry, Tom, 17. Okay. So, but, but you started off with your own capital. You were efficient and used, used debt to, to, to fund some of the early growth, which is what we also did at uh, eTails, uh, using a line of credit against uh, our, our inventory, which was very, very efficient. Um, but you know, sometime around, I don't know, uh, in 2017, I recall you raised, I don't know, 15 million or so in a, in a, in a mezzanine financing. Mezzanine financing. I mean, you know, we, and by the way, we did use some really good people. And I think Tom, you're connected to them. Cascadia helped us take the lead on this. And I want to mention their name because they're out, they're out of uh, Portland, wait, Seattle. Yeah. But, but and, Kevin um, Cable, Kevin Cable, who's actually one of the, the founders of Cascadia, uh, lives here in Spokane. Yeah, Kevin is just a super guy. And I know you know him well, yep. but yep. it's amazing what Cascadia has done. So we contracted with them uh, to help broker us to go out and look for a deal. So we put a, you know, we put a book together, basically what's a book, you know, it's a CIM, um, um, confidential information memorandum, That's right? That's what a CIM is. So, so they took that book that has, you know, who are, who is the leadership team? What are your goals? What are your objectives? How long you've been in business? What's your revenue? What's your EBITDA? I mean, you, you, you get it. And so we took that to market. We found a company that we initially raised called Bank Street. They're out of, uh, out of actually, I was going to say New York, but they're out of Connecticut. Um, so we initially raised uh, $10 million in, uh, in, in mezzanine equity, and then we raised another $5 million with the same group. Now, mezzanine equity, mez equity, is very expensive. Like, do not look at the interest rates because you won't like them. You'll just be, you'll be kind of shocked, okay? But here's the deal. Like, you don't want to sell the equity in your company because you're not quite there yet. Like you, you know, there's a certain time when you can get the, the company over and even out of a certain number, you're willing to sell off equity. But there's this time and period where high finance, high interest rate money, it's okay because it's less, you're getting 
less than you would if you sold equity at that particular point in time. And Tom, you probably can explain it a lot better than I can, but, but mezzanine debt is, is, is a good vehicle. If you want to share something more, please do. Well, so, I mean, so basically it had, a, it had a, uh, a higher interest rate than you might you know, otherwise get at a bank. Um, it had some warrants. And the intent is that the investors get a return that's somewhere between equity and bank financing. So that's why it's called mezzanine because it's, it's in between. But for the but but to but to the issuer, the company like Fatbeam, it's um, it's basically non-dilutive. You have a little bit of warrants, um, but it, but it's but it's far less dilutive and less co costly than a traditional VC or equity round. Your owners, yeah. well said. But, but, it, but okay. it does imply uh, that you've got you know, at least some level of EBITDA and profitability. And so, what, but so, but yep. my question is, what did you need the ten or fifteen million dollars for? So, as I mentioned earlier, um, so so today we we have I, I think we're probably closing we're closing in now on a thousand miles of fiber optic cable throughout the Western United States. So. So today we're in 40, 40 plus markets west of Denver. So if you draw a line north and south of Denver, we're in seven or eight states and we're in 40 markets, uh, typically markets under 100,000, or excuse me, under 150,000 in population, communities or suburbs outside of Seattle. So um, things like that. But you need to build fiber optic network to get that school district contract. It's, it's very expensive to do that. So. So we use the capital, not for operating expenses, because we had covered our operating expenses, but we were using it for additional either acquisition, if we could find an acquisition target, or in our case, we were using it to build more fiber. I know people don't like to see fiber optics on poles, power poles, they don't like that. There's a reason they're up there, and that's about $50,000 a mile to build on a pole. It's about $100,000 a mile if you put it underground. So if you have a million miles, excuse me, if you have a thousand miles of fiber optics, then you can sort of back into how much money that costs. It's very expensive. But in our case, um, you know, it, it just, it made sense. And, and of course, the mezzanine or any of our financing, whether it was the local bank or whether it was the mez folks, they, they very much love the school district contract. Like that's a government contract that you have and you're holding. So it's a very secure contract. But, but that's what we used it for is growth. A very unique business model. Did you have, did you have many competitors in the 40 markets you were in? There was a lot of competition in the Midwest. There was a lot in the East Coast, but there wasn't much going on in the West. So we really put our footprint on the West. I mean, my job was to get out there. I can't believe 10 years went by, but, we, you know, we've had some really good success, but uh, we hit the time where they say timing's everything. So, yeah. Okay, then, then we'll, we'll continue with the chronological order here. Um, earlier this year, uh, you sold 51% uh, of Fatbeam to basically a, a private equity firm for $36 million. And, and what, what, what uh, tell me how that came about. Why was now the right timing versus a year ago or, or next year? Provide some color on that. Oh, you know, you, you try to take the company as far as you can um, with your own financing and you got the meds financing and, and now you're, you're getting up there. You're, you know, your capital needs in this, in this particular case are, you know, tens and twenties of millions of dollars a year. I mean, it's, it's very capital intensive. So, so when you look at, you know, when you sort of look at all come together, there's, there's the capital requirements. There are some acquisition opportunities that, that we were after. And so, uh, but, but not only, and the capital was available, but not only those couple of items, more importantly, the values were there in our industry. They were, they were paying high, you know, sort of high multiples of EBITDA. So we're talking about annualized EBITDA. And we, you know, I can't really go into detail about what those were, but let's just say that, you know, there, there was good, good numbers being provided to us about if we went out and we wanted to sell equity, what would it be if we sold minority piece of equity? What would it be if we sold a majority piece? So, so sort of everything aligned once again, and we said, look, you know, we're not interested in cashing out. We want to keep growing the business, but, but we do need deeper pockets. So, so we came to an agreement where um, we would sell, you know, I think, it, well, I think they ended up buying a little more than 51% of the company, but I know that in the press release back then it was about 51, but I think they're like 56 or something like that percent. 
my partner Sean and I own the other part of that. So let's let's say that you know whatever percent that comes to. There's Sean, there's Greg, and then there's the you know 55, 6, 56 percent from SDC. SDC is known as what we call. They came in and bought it. They own other companies that build fiber optics across the United States and globally. They own other companies that build 5G cell towers that install fiber to 5G cell towers. So this fiber thing's all in their wheelhouse. And, and most importantly, they have a lot of connections in the industry. So they liked what we had built. They came in. Um, I stepped down as the CEO. They want to bring in their own folks. Completely understand that. And, um, you know, essentially, there'll be a payday for us. But right now, I sit on the board. And, and with Sean, I'm a co-founder. He's on the board as well. And, you know, we, we just kind of want to continue to grow the business. So it's, it's kind of nice not to have that stress every day. But uh, we're what excited about what's going on. What an amazing story. Um, I'm going to ask you a few more questions, but I also want to open it up to the group. So if anybody has a question, you know, please submit it to me and then I will queue you up. Um, but um, before, we, before we kind of get into that, uh, the logical question is you've now started grown and exited three businesses successfully are you going to retire now and get fat again or what are you going to do next er, um, er? I, you, you know i i i don't i really want to enjoy life you know i feel like uh you mean really you haven't enjoyed it already well no I've, i mean i've enjoyed it along the way and i have i've, I've played really well and trust me i've i've i've, I've had periods of time where I've, I've indulged in a lot of fun things, but, um, you know, th there's just the little things, they literally, the little things, you know, th there's, there's places that I've not traveled or visited and I like to go do some of that. I can, I can do those from anywhere now, just like COVID taught us a lot. Right. So, but, but honestly, I get calls weekly. I had a couple yesterday, one today, I get calls about opportunities and, and, and people will say, Greg, we'll fund you, go find a deal or go find a business plan. You know, I'm just not really sure that's what I want to do. You know, I'm not really convinced that I want to go back and work 60, 70 hours a week. So, um, do you think you'll really be able to relax? It, it's been hard so far. I'm, I'm not going to kid you. I went to, I went and hired a, a professional counselor to say, hey, look, you know, how can I do this? And she's like, Greg. So she has me doing, and I'm like, if you're going to tell me what I want to hear, then you're probably not a counselor for me. I need you to tell me the things that I need to hear. And that's some, you know, some counselors aren't capable, but this one is. So every week I have homework, just like a child, I have homework, like, great. Go define what, you know, this means, or go define what solace means. So that's one of my projects for next week. But I'm gonna, I'm not gonna kid you, I'm struggling a little bit to slow down, but I think that I can invest in another company maybe sit on the board much like what you do, Tom. And so I still play a little bit of a role. I keep active, but yet I can enjoy the finer things in life and, and, and the simple things in life too. You know, these hands maybe get, these hands maybe get a paper cut once in a while, but they've not built a house for a habitat for humanity. I can do that. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Well, I, I, may, I may take you up on some uh, board opportunities, but we do have a question. We have a question okay, from you got? Your, your banker. Uh, so beware. Uh, oh, Dimitri, boy. fire away. Hello, Greg. Thanks for uh, thanks for having this today. Very uh, great to hear your story. I've known you for several years, um, and I've known you to be very grounded and, and humble person, despite everything you've accomplished and built over your career. Uh, that's something that's not often easy to do. Is there someone or something that you attribute that to? Um. Boy, that's a, that's a good one. I thought you were going to call one of my notes or something. I mean, you were saying such nice things. I thought you were just going to call a note and tell me that I owed you money. Or, well, so. I start with a soft question first, and then we go to that. You know, I, I, I am strange. I'll tell you, I um, thank you for the nice comments. I, I, I'm going to tell you, Tom and I are a lot alike. I don't know where I got it. Maybe it's from my mother, but... You know, I remember when I sold a company, um, they decided to let me go as a CEO. And I'm just a really trusting person. And I probably should have negotiated harder, but you know, the first person to call me was Tom. He was the only person to call me, was Tom. <laughs> this stuff happens all the time. People sell companies and this happens. And, and I know that, but you feel, you per, feel pretty insignificant at the time. 
And so I guess, you know, I, I really, I have kind of a heart. I mean, like if, if somebody's down and they need to pick me up, whatever it is, I'll be there. And I've not always been the perfect person in the world, but you know, there's only one life you get. And, um, you know, I try to be humble because if I don't, if I don't keep track on being humble, and then the big guy will do it for me. And I, I think it's a lot better if I can do it myself because when he does it, it's like those are big swings. You know, you're in a valley that you don't want to be in sometimes. <laughs> so thank you, Dimitri. I'm not sure I properly answered your question, but thanks for it. You have, thank you. So, so question, what, Greg, you know, now 35 years later from, from uh, after you started your first company, Telewest, what advice would you today give to the gray green of 35 years ago? It's pretty simple. I put it right here. Um, I don't have my glasses on, but have you ever heard the serenity prayer? Uh, God, serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That pretty much sums everything up in life. Oh, I mean, okay. I, as a CEO, you're trying to drive something home. You're trying to get the bank to get your terms. You can't have everything that you want. And there are times to push. And then there are times that, you know, you need to have some sympathy and understanding. You may have an employee that has a personal life problem. And, you know, I mean, I, those things, you know, you think that you have it all together and you have an employee that is going through a personal challenge. You know, it's my responsibility to be there for them. So. Um, but anyway, that's serenity prayers. I, you know, it's something that I would encourage you to, to read because it's like, how can you get more of a message out of a, what, 30 words than that? So. Yep. Yep. You know, you, you, of the three companies, um, that you've started, what, what, what would you view as your, um, as your biggest success? The thing that you're proudest of? Um, out of, of fat beam, um, you know, I, I look at it as there, 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 there are markets that, uh, Lake Havasu, um, there are rural markets like, you know, Yakima or, uh, Butte, Montana that, you know, the phone and the cable companies have been there for, you know, 20 or 50 or hundred years, and they've not been able to deliver what a school needs for distance learning. And we are able to do that in a couple of years. So, you know, there's a, I mean, never because of profitability, they can invest more money in Seattle or New York today and get a better return than they can get in Butte, Montana. Um, so there are still opportunities out there, you know, and you just have to look at things differently sometimes. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of FAPI, no question. Next Link was a great run. I mean, how many people like me at my age, I was 36 when we went on the IPO, how many people get to know Craig McCaw, you know? I mean, that, that's pretty special. And I get to talk to him once in a while and, and I met some great friends. There's a guy named Jim Bulker. He and I are just, he's a Seattle guy. And he and I are really close. And we got a buddy that has ALS. So man, you think you got it all together and your friend has ALS, you drop what you're doing to go see him. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. And that, that really is the type of guy that you are, Greg. I mean, you are humble. Uh, you're always there. And, and I, I really appreciated that as aspect of you and our friendship over the years. Oh, we've got a question next from Steve Watts. Um, you know, Steve, do you want to chime in and ask your question of Greg? Sure, please. Thank you. Um, Greg, we enjoyed listening to you. Love your energy. It's contagious. Um, we've all received advice over the years, over the course of careers, that has really stuck with us. It didn't seem like it was all that important at the time, but year after year, it just it kind of it, it reappears. And uh, after a while, it's memorialized. I'm just curious if you have any pieces of business advice you've received that you'd be willing to share with us that have stood the test of time. You know, I, I think one of the things I'm just beginning to realize it now because, uh, you know, the career winds down a little bit. I don't feel like we're I'm finished yet, but that, that is that life is short. You know, it's very cliche, but at the end of the day, you know, as I go through, I, I mean, I was honest enough to tell you that I'm, I'm seeing a counselor to figure out how to slow down, right? At the end of the day, um, do you really want to be, you know, do, what do you want to be known as? 
And, and, um, and somebody asked me that early on in my career and I'm like, I just blew it off because, you know, that's a silly question. What do you mean? Um, you know, because at that age, when you're young, I just want to be rich. But honestly, you know, what, what's important to you? You know, what do you really want to, you want somebody to build a monument because you're a great, uh, you know, a great CEO or you're a great businessman or, or, or do you have other philanthropy? philanthropic type, philanthropy, excuse me, uh, types of things that you can do that would change the world and better, better things in your community or, or the world. So, you know, it's only now that I'm really taking that advice, Steve, which is, what do you want to be defined as? And, and I'm not sure a businessman's it. So I'm sorry, I felt like I worked all the way around that question. But, but, you know, time's precious. Indeed. Thank you. Harley Wolf, oh, Steve, did you have one more comment there? No, I was just thinking. Perfect. Charlie Wolf, you have a question. Yeah, thanks again, Greg. Echo everybody's comments. It's inspirational and, and the optimism is awesome and contagious. I guess uh, the one question I think this, this group in, in the call is working towards would be the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I guess I've seen this in a couple other markets, but um, I think we have some self-imposed caps or limits on our own business growth. And you seem to have blown past those in, in all of your entrepreneurial efforts. I guess any advice you've got for businesses uh, trying to grow companies outside of the market, regionally, what have you, but, but getting past maybe perceptions of, of growth limitation, hopefully that makes sense. One thing I didn't do till recently, uh, Charlie, thank you for the question. One thing I didn't do was reach out to uh, the Kathy McMorrises that are more than willing to help you in this community. Um, I really, I really never thought that, that, you know, forgive me, that the government was really there to help. <laughs> I just never thought that. And I really have learned how important the last couple of years, you know, I see Kathy on an airplane all the time going to Washington, D.C. And so we'll chat. But you know, those, just don't forget about the resources around you. In your case, you know, you've got some great resources because you have family, but, but don't forget about, you know, think out of the box. Like, are, are, what, what is your impediment to growth? Is your impediment a regulatory issue? Is your impediment capital, human resources? What is it? Um, and then, you know, if you feel like you're stuck in, in a box, share it with Tom or share it with, and he can share it with somebody like myself or, or, or someone else. Just don't ever quit thinking of ways to get out of the box. So, um, you know, there's, there's, there's always a different way to do something. And, and there are resources, and I forget all of the resources there are, but there are human resources, there are financial resources, there are legal resources. There's another way to do it. And just because somebody hasn't done it, that doesn't mean it's not the way. So um, I, I'd love to hear more about your business too. Great. Thank well, it's, you. It's, it's, it's one, it's one o'clock and I want to be very efficient with people's time, but we do have one more question from uh, Ben at 10 capital. Ben fire away. Going on, Greg. Thanks for sharing today. But well, something that I always admire or I admire about business owners that I haven't wrapped my head around it yet is how they can maintain passion and energy. Like I've seen it multiple times, you know, with business owners and even my own folks starting a company locally. And it's hard, like psychologically, it's really rough. And to do it three times, uh, I mean, you're a special breed, Greg, I've got to say, and you too, Tom. So how do you guys, maybe both of you, how do you maintain the energy and passion? I mean, I can't imagine, Greg, you thought, I want to put fiber in the ground to schools as a 12-year-old, right? And that just really gets me going. So what is it that really uh, drove you through some of these times that, you know, the first five years that are just a psychological mind Naughty so the, the, the honest truth is probably no one would hire Tom or I. That's probably <laughs> the honest truth. Okay. No, 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 don't tell me. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. No, but, but, but this is. Unemployable. This is the, okay, yeah, that, that's better. What do you say? No, but this is really so true. Like, I, I have to be careful how I say this, but I work between one of the career stops and, and I've had, like we talked about three companies. I think there's actually 11 or 12, but they're just very small ones that I've been part of and funded. But, but I went to work as a consultant to help a company one time. And it was between uh, Avista Communications and, and Fatbeam. It was about six months. I hated it. 
I, I, it, it, it was eating me. It's, it was eating me inside out to think that all of the ideas, the concepts I was doing for, for someone else. I just, it, it, like, I've got to get out of here. Like, this is, this is not good for me. And, and I guess my point is I'm not any more special than anybody else. It's just, I don't play very well in the same sandbox as everybody else does. And, and maybe that's a problem that I have. I don't know. But all I'm trying to say is that working for that hourly rate isn't what I was after. That doesn't, it doesn't satisfy me inside. It doesn't work. Now, don't get me wrong. I have a, one of my best friends has worked for Baxter Edwards for 40 some years. He's got stock options. He's doing very well. He's a millionaire. That's great. He, he likes that. It's safe. He loves it. It's comfortable. It just doesn't work for me. It just, it's just something that if there's a drive inside, there's a fire and I have to do something different and unique. I guess it, I would, I would liken it to if you were a painter, like, you know, I'm sorry, mom, I'm not going to be a barista. I'm going to be a painter. That's what I want to do. That energy, that passion is how I would like it. Well, it's kind of one of the, the defining attributes of an entrepreneur. Um, very much so. Well, it's, it's a few minutes after one, so I, I want to uh, begin to conclude here, but Greg, thank you very much. I mean, this is, um, you know, although I've known you for 35 years now, there are a lot of elements of this story that I was not aware of that you brought to life, and I got a ton out of it. So thank you very much. And I am going to take you up on perhaps getting you involved in, in, in a board seat or two so you can share your wisdom with all, many other startups in the area. And uh, hey, I, I'll look forward to this next, the next time we do one of these and being a listener because uh, I love to soak up knowledge. So thanks, Tom. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Hey, now, Cindy, uh, before we conclude, Cindy, what, 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 what is our, our, our next uh, Ignite Talks or our, our next event? Yep, we have two programs coming up. So October 7th, we have Meet the Investor with Heather Redman from Flying Fish. And then on October 15th, we have Ignite Talks with John Connors from Ignition. So those are our next two. And, and John, John's a fascinating story. Um, you know, former CFO of Microsoft, uh, now at Ignition Partners, which just is starting a new firm called Fuse. Um, so that will be a, uh, a, a very compelling presentation like today with Greg and, and uh, little known fact about John Connors is he actually grew up in a small town in Montana. So uh, small towns are, are, are emerging communities are, are part of his passion. So thanks, Cindy. Um, with that, thanks everybody. And, and thanks again to you, Greg, and look forward to seeing you at uh, our upcoming events. Have a great week. What's left of it? Peace out. Thank you.